Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum warahmatullahi 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 wa
And he basically outlawed and banned belief in Allah and any kind of practice of religion. And these, this group of young men, and they're described in the Quran as fitya, right? Which is very, very young. One could even estimate that they could have very likely been teenagers, young men. They gathered together and they said that obviously we believe in Allah and everything we have is given to us by Allah and we know that we must live a life of devotion to Allah and we're not willing to live life like this. We're not willing to live this way. So what can we do? What's in our capacity? What's in our control? And that's when they d made the very difficult decision, إِذْ أَوَ الْفِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَحْفِ They basically said, we will leave our homes, we will leave our families behind, and we will escape and live somewhere in obscurity, take refuge somewhere, anywhere, in the middle of the wilderness, inside of a cave, up in the mountains, but we're willing to go and just live in obscurity, taking refuge, living in refuge and asylum, if that's what is required in order for us to be able to believe in Allah and live our faith. And I want everyone to understand and really think about how difficult that is. And what a profound sacrifice that is. To be able to, to be willing to sacrifice everything, anything, everyone, anyone, for the sake of Allah. Ask yourself, I need to ask myself, would I be willing to do that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. May Allah not test us. But if it ever came down to a choice where I had to choose between Allah and everything and everyone else, what would I choose? And these young men had to make that choice. And there were Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, companions of the Prophet who had to make that choice. We don't realize this, but in the fourth year of the Prophet's mission, not hijrah, his mission, so after four years of preaching in Mecca, almost a hundred Muslims had to go and live as refugees in asylum in East Africa, Abyssinia, Habasha. And amongst them was the daughter of the Prophet he had, this, he had to watch his own daughter leave. And there's a narration that talks about it where somebody was traveling on the road back to Mecca and there was an old lady in the group. So the Prophet ﷺ went to her, you know, expecting her not to be maybe somebody who would be too um, aggressive or somebody who wouldn't have too much animosity against the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. And he asked her, he's like, did you see a group of people traveling? And she said, yeah. And he said, did you see perchance maybe there was a, a young girl, like a younger woman, and she would have had her husband with her. He's also a younger guy. And she said, yeah, actually I did. And they looked like this and they were wearing this. And the Prophet said, yeah, yeah, how were they? And then she described that the young lady was riding the animal. And the young man who was with her, her husband, he was holding the rope of the animal and he was walking and they were both smiling. They seemed happy. And they were talking to one another. And the Prophet ﷺ started to smile and he started thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sacrifice. So these young men made that ultimate sacrifice and they go to that cave. And when they arrive there in that cave, they make a dua and we'll come back to that dua in just a moment. But they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they don't know what to do. The Quran tells us that as they were on their way towards the cave, they were looking for a place to take refuge. Eventually they found this cave in the hills, but on the way, for the sake of their protection, 
there was a dog, just a stray dog, just walking around, sitting around. And he saw them and he just started following them. And he followed them all the way to the cave. And once they got to the cave, they went and they sat down. Now what do you do? You just, you're not sure. What am I doing here? How long am I going to be here? What am I supposed to do here? What does this mean? What's my purpose? What's the next step? What are the plans? You don't know anything. So they made dua and we're going to talk about the dua. And eventually they're tired after all their journeys and everything like that. And so they lay down and they go to sleep. وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِطٌ ذِرَاعَيْهِ بِالْوَصِيدِ And the dog goes and sits down at the mouth of the cave, the opening of the cave. He sits down there. You know, and the Qur'an even describes how he's sitting with his arms like kind of stretched out, how dogs sit. And the dog sits down there, they lay down in the cave. And it's called a kahaf, it has a big opening. Because they go to sleep. And as they go to sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns them in their sleep. Allah turns them one way, then turns them the other way. So that they don't develop bed sores. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَقْرِذُهُمْ Right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes it so that the rays of the sun, the mouth of the cave is big, so sunlight does come in and wind does come in. But then Allah makes it so that the rays of the sun don't directly hit them. So it doesn't end up burning them. They don't get sunburned. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously makes it so that the rays of the sun, instead of coming directly at them, are diverted away from them and it just provides light inside of the cave. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nourishes them miraculously because food is not what nourishes us. It's the command of Allah within the food that nourishes us. Water does not quench our thirst or hydrate our bodies. I know this is maybe offending some people, okay? But it, it, it doesn't, right? There's somebody sitting here who's pre-med and is like, what are you talking, brother, right? So, what is this? Yeah. Subhanallah. Ibrahim alayhi makes a dua. وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينِي Allah is the one who feeds me, nourishes me, satiates me. You know, provides nutrition to me. And Allah is the one who quenches my thirst and hydrates my body. It is the command of Allah within that. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nourishing them, hydrating them through His command. If Allah can change the nature of fire, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot allow the blade to cut the neck of Ismail, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can split the sea from Musa, Harun alayhim as salam and their followers, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can lift Isa alayhi salam up into the sky, so how can, why do we doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could nourish them and hydrate them and provide for them eat without food and water? And that's exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. And they kept on sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. That dog sat there napping while sitting. And then the Qur'an says that they slept there for 309 years. 309 years. And when they woke up, it felt like a nap to them. It felt like a nap to them and they sat up and they looked at each other and they're like, we've been here for like half a day, we should really figure things out. <laughs> and then they're like, I feel kind of hungry. Do you feel kind of hungry? Yeah, I feel hungry too. Right? And so then, they send out some of their buddies to go and try to find food for them. And the story carries on from there that the coins, the, some money that they have, that when he takes it in the marketplace and they're like, what's this? This is bizarre. They think they're counterfeiting or something. 
So they nab him, they arrest him, and then they take him to the court. And when they take him to the court, and somebody in the court looks at it, who's a historian who knows this, and he looks at it and goes, these are ancient coins. Where did you get this from? This is a historical relic. Where did you attain this from? And he goes, what do you mean? It's just some change, pocket change that we had. Sorry. And he's like, no, no, no. Who are you people? And then he tells him, he goes, look, we, we, you know, he's being evasive, but then he's looking around as well, and the, the people seem different. And then he sees some people praying and worshiping, and he's like, what's going on over here? So then he tells them who they are, that we're just some young men who believe, and we escaped. But we didn't want to be persecuted. And he goes, why would we persecute you? We believe as well. And he, the, 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 the court people mention Allah, and prophets of Allah, and... And he's like, what is happening here? And then when he tells them the king that they fled from, he goes, that was three centuries ago. What are you talking about? He goes, I swear I'm not lying to you. And then he brings them to the cave and they find all the rest of their companions. And then basically they're welcomed by the Muslim rulers of that time. And they are hosted. And then from there the narrations are varied whether they lived a long life or a short life, but they are able to then live as part of a Muslim, a believing community. And the, the king of that time, the people of that time, wrote down their story, and that's why they're also called Ashabur Raqim. They wrote down their story, they inscribed it into stone tablets so that it would be lesson, a lesson for the end of times. And... That is the story of the people of the cave and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for them, Allah protected them, and how Allah took care of them, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them what they ultimately longed for. And that was to be able to worship Allah and to live as believers and be in a community of believers. And this remarkable story was revealed to our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu was preaching and teaching the message of Islam in Mecca, and the Meccans of Quraysh, they didn't know what to do. They, were, they felt defeated by the Qur'an. So then they consulted with some of the Jewish and the Christian tribes in Arabia. And they said, give, our, give us some questions that we can use to try to stump Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one of the questions they gave them were, ask him about the people of the cave, the young men in the cave. And they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they asked him the question. And the Prophet ﷺ waited for the answer, the revelation to come from Allah. And this is a bit of a technical story, or a technical detail rather. But when the Prophet ﷺ, they asked him the question, he said, okay, I'll get you the answer tomorrow. And the narration tells us that he didn't say, inshallah, if Allah wills. And he kept waiting for the story to come to him. One day, two days, three days, four days, five days. One narration says 18 days went by. And the story still did not come to him. Until finally Allah revealed the story to him. And then the Prophet ﷺ told them the story about the young men that were in the cave. And the reason why I mentioned this particular detail is because the dua will also talk about this. All right, so that's the general gist of the story of the young man in the cave and how and why that was revealed to the Prophet. Surah number 18, Surah Al Kahf. And going back into the story, when they went to the cave and they didn't know what they were supposed to do, they made a dua. And Allah tells us what that dua was. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. إذ أول فتية إلى الكهف فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة this dua, I'm sure that, you know, Sheikh more than qualified to explain it, but he's being kind by letting me try. Um, this dua is remarkable. A lot of reflections, subhanAllah. The first is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions them as young people. And this, again, to the casual reader, might not stick out. Allah is just mentioning them as their identity. Oh, they're young people. But for us, young people... Some of, <clears throat> some of us. Uh, for almost all of us, we 
associate devotion and religiosity and spirituality to elder ages. And we think that the time for worship and the time for du'a is when I'm not busy. And if you've ever traveled to like Muslim majority countries and you've been to their masajid and you've seen, one thing that you'll notice is that typically more often than not, their prayer lines are filled more with those who are a little bit senior in age. They don't have the, the presence. You know, one of the things that I see and I hear a lot when people come to places, not only Qadam, by the way, but everywhere, Valley Ranch or Epic, or even outside of Dallas. You know, I was in a masjid in San Francisco, or in the Bay Area, and I was there, and there was a brother who was from Saudi Arabia, and he, he just kept talking about how many young people are in the masjid. And he was, like, astounded. He's like, what? what you know, he's like, in our country, we keep hearing about America as the great Satan, which they're, like, half right. Right? Like America has one horn, right? But, but then the other side of it, they say, is that there's this presence of young people. I mean, look around and look. And this is not a knock on anyone who's maybe a little bit older, but just look at this gathering. And it's, it's, it's a weeknight. I'm assuming some of you have work tomorrow. Or maybe you work from home, right, Sheikh? Work, work from home. Let me log into this meeting real quick. Is that your pillow? <laughs> no, it's my chair, right? But we associate youth with so many other different forms of productivity. We don't associate youth with spirituality. And one of the things I think that we are witnessing, and we are, it's, it's a privilege that Allah is letting us be a part of this, is that as many of us are either first or second generation Muslims, including those who converted to Islam, they're technically first generation Muslims, right? In this country, we are seeing now what it means to develop something from the ground up. And it requires young people to be devoted. When our elders came here, may Allah reward them, and established where we sit today, they were young. They were fewer than us, but they were just the same age. So Allah is attaching a certain kind of spiritual opening, right? Spiritual power with doing this in your young age. I always tell the story, and I'm going to tell it again because it's, it's one of my favorites, of the woman who came to Hajj with us, and she was very, very senior. And she came by herself. Zero out of ten, do not recommend. <laughs> Sending a senior to Hajj by themselves. Luckily... We had two people on Hajj with us that year. Sheikh Mubin Kamani was one of them, right, from Frisco, Masha, mashallah. And a young college age or young professional student who Sheikh Mubin Kamani was going to command to take care of this woman. <laughs> and he did. He told the young guy, hey, are you here with anybody? He said, no. He said, okay, well, now you are. <laughs> Meet Shagufta auntie, right? So I always, <laughs> that's, my, that's the name I got to go with, right? Meet Shagufta you are going to be her responsibility. Or sorry, other way around. She is going to be your responsibility. Honestly, a little bit of both. Auntie, let's go. Beta, have you eaten? It's, it's, that's what happened, yeah. Credit to this young man. He said that before he came, one of his uh, sheikhs told him that Allah will open up your hajj for you through the door of khidmah. And Sheikh Mubin was like, here you go. He took care of her the whole time, mashallah, as if she really was his mother. It was really remarkable. And when we finished our hajj, the monastic, when we finished our, the rituals, and we stoned the pillars for the last time, everybody gets very emotional and they start to cry because we did hajj. I mean, if you haven't done hajj, think of it this way. You're only four-fifths Muslim. There's one pillar that's missing. And we assume that we're like Muslim, Muslim. And we haven't really done hajj. And you think to yourself, like, when you do hajj, you'll break down because you finally have completed it. You've done all the five pillars. So everyone's crying and they're hugging and they're emotional. But there's a little bit of happiness, right? Like people are laughing and smiling. But there's one person that's crying and she's not smiling, and that's the auntie. So Mufti Kamani, myself, some of the other, you know, Qadam uh, staff, we go over to her and we're trying to, like, 
make sure she's okay. Sometimes the emotions can get very strong. So we say, Andi, mashallah, look what you've done. Like, you, you did it. You did your hajj. Like, all of your sins are forgiven. Like, this is amazing. You know, mashallah, we're just trying to hype her up, you know? The, the verbal equivalent of the flame emoji. <laughs> like, flame, 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 right? 100, 100, we're just like sending it her way. And she says something, wallahi, I'll never forget. The Qalam group tends to be a little bit younger. If you go for Umrah, Spain, inshallah, Spain with us June 22nd, inshallah, if you go any of these trips, tend to be a little bit on the younger side. No, again, no offense, but it just is what it is. She looked around and she saw a lot of young people doing hajj. And a lot of young people hugging each other. A lot of young people celebrating. And she says, I'm happy and I'm so thankful to Allah that he allowed me to do this. And I'm so lucky that Allah sent this young guy to just come and take care of me. He doesn't even know who I am. But she goes, my mind and my heart cannot stop asking the question, what kind of Muslim could I have become if I did this earlier? And she goes, for many people, it's a matter of circumstance. They couldn't do it earlier because of money or whatever. She goes, but I could. And I waited. And she got so happy and she said, I'm so happy you did it at a young age. Because now your Islam, your completeness, will give you a trajectory that I will never have known what I could have become had I done it earlier. I, know, I won't know what I could have become. إِذْ أَوَلْ فِتْيَةُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here highlights their youth. Committing to Allah now. There's a reason. There's a reason why the, under the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the, 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 the groups that is mentioned, the hadith, is the young person who's attached to the masjid. Because there's so many distractions. When you get older, the masjid kind of becomes, <laughs> the masjid actually can become a distraction from your, ho- from your home. There's some uncles and, and brothers, I know, some fathers, they get a little bit frustrated at home, and I'm going for Isha. <laughs> your kids, like, kids are like, no dad, don't go. They're like, leave me alone, I'm going for Isha. Everyone's like, that guy's religious. No, he just hates being home. <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both, right? No, may Allah Ta'ala give us good happiness in our homes. But doing it specifically when you're younger, when Allah knows that you have a lot of things on your plate, a lot of temptations, a lot of things pulling you away, there's something really special about that. May Allah Ta'ala make us amongst them. Allahumma fashad. May Allah witness that we are here, Ya Allah. We're young, Ya Allah. All of us, we're young. <laughs> Sheikh is young, man. I'm telling you, you see him on the court, he's young. MashaAllah. Ila al kahfi Allah Ta'ala... He allowed them to take refuge in a cave. When you think about a cave, you know, caves are not fun. I know caves, like, we think of it as like, oh, it's a cave. Caves are dark, they're dingy, they're musty, right? They're not very nice places. But that became their sanctuary. Where do we find safety? Anywhere with Allah. Anywhere. Your safety, for those of you who work in, like, corporate and stuff, you might be able to relate to this. Your safety could be in the stairwell that you pray in. That could be the most safe place you feel at work. Your safety can be in the hallway or a library classroom. Your safety could be, hopefully, the masjid. Anywhere where you feel close to Allah is your refuge. For them, they were able to take a cave. I mean, we, we watch these shows like home makeovers. This is the ultimate makeover. They took a random crevice carved out of rock where there was nothing but stone cold and they said this is the place where we're going to preserve our faith don't ever underestimate where Allah can be found and where Allah can let you find guidance it can be anywhere Allah is truly capable as long as the place itself is a place that doesn't put your ethics and your and your spiritual compass in jeopardy Allah Ta'ala is always accessible in those moments. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا Again, calling upon Allah in a moment of weakness and vulnerability. آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً Give us from your possession, your power, your ability, your capacity, your mercy. Grant us your mercy. Mercy is one of the most beautiful things to ask for because there's a couple things. Number one is who doesn't need the mercy of Allah? But sometimes we, we overlook mercy as being like a very vague thing to ask for. Oh, Allah, grant us mercy. 
What do you imagine? Mercy, let me give you the, the translation. Ibn Ajiba, he says this in the tafsir. He says, mercy is that Allah gives you what you need when you need it. What you need when you need it. And that's why mercy can come in different forms. For some people, mercy is the opening of an opportunity. For some people, it's closing. There could be two people who are asking for rahmah, and one of them gets the job, and the other one doesn't get the job. But they both got the mercy of Allah. Because Allah will give you what you need when you need it. There's a huge element of tawakkul in mercy. Oh Allah, grant me your mercy. Facilitate for me. Open the doors for me of goodness, wherever they may be. Guide me. That's why they say, وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا And grant us, O Allah, the guidance that only you can give us through this entire situation that we're in. The next ayah, Shaykh and I were just talking about this. When you think of mercy, they're running away from a community of people that are persecuting them, right? They're running away from a leader that's tyrannical, that's a religious uh, a tyrant against religion, and they're trying to adhere to, yeah, adhere to the truth. Allah could have sent mercy in many different ways. And you learn this from the seerah as well. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, he makes dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the answer in a different form. Maybe than what we would expect. So then Allah ta'ala says, فَدَرَبَنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ فِي الْكَحْفِ سِنِينَ عَدَدًا Allah ta'ala caused them to fall into a state of slumber. That was the mercy that they were seeking. I know a lot of us are like, yeah, naps are merciful. But remember, this is a huge, huge state of mercy because it was a protection against what would have been their destruction and perhaps, ready, the destruction of the religion or the lineage of the religion that they followed. They were alone. They were a small group of people. And so in that moment, what they needed was protection at any cost. Now I want you to imagine this. Imagine that they're making dua and then an angel comes to them and tells them, you're going to fall asleep for 309 years. Let's, let's, let's be human and, and let's speculate a little bit. We're not trying to speak definitively what a response could have been. If you make dua to Allah for mercy and an angel shows up and says, you're going to be asleep for three centuries. You're like, wait a minute, I didn't ask for that. How? how? What? What about the dog? <laughs> how are we going to eat? How are we going to drink? All the what, where, what, where, how, who, why, all that, right? This is why dua, you have to place all of your trust in the dua. And this is why sometimes the dua, the answer is not what you want. Ibn Atallah, he says this. He goes, when you make dua, don't try to solve the dua that you're making. Make the dua and let Allah take care of it for you. Don't, don't preoccupy your mind. There's a difference between tying your camel and trying to make a new camel. Allah Ta'ala, the Prophet Sallallahu said, tie the camel. He didn't say strangle the camel. He didn't say buy a few more just in case. No. Trust in Allah. Man, there's people over here loving that. They love that joke. I got nothing over here. There's apparently some camel fanatics to my extreme left, all right? Camel milk outside for sale after, apparently. Okay. But the point being is many of us, our interpretation of making dua is like really not what the Prophet ﷺ said. Tie the camel and trust in Allah. And so Allah Ta'ala gave that answer. Now, the tafsir that I, I read for this, one of the tafsirs that I read for this, amazing. And I'll just share with you what he said because I don't say anything. I mean, I just read from the tafsir and give it to you. He says that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's sunnah, Allah's practice with people who cut themselves off from anything that will harm their relationship with him. Like, they're not going to risk it. You know, many of us, a lot of our spiritual anxiety is found in places of gray areas. The Prophet said, you know, this is why in the hadith he says that the halal is clear and the haram is clear. And he said that, and between them are some pretty questionable things, confusing things, gray areas. He said that, لا يعلمهم كثير من الناس. A lot of people don't know how to answer these questions or how to figure these things out. This is where a lot of our spiritual anxiety comes from. So there's two approaches. Number one, you can try to always walk the tightrope, always. 
But what happens when you always try to walk the tightrope? What happens when you always try to balance on the razor's edge? You might, one out of 10 or one out of 50 times, you might make it across, but 49 times you're going to get cut. And that's kind of how we understand the sharia. In moments where you absolutely need a concession, where there's no way out, where everything is constricted, you seek refuge with a scholar, you ask a sheikh, sheikh, is this okay? I really don't want to, but is this okay? The sheikh will say, yes, actually in sharia, there is a concession for your example. This is the one time. But if a person gets used to it over and over and over again, they're going to eventually start shaving away whatever iman they have. So he says, for people who their practice is anytime I see my faith is in danger, I close myself off and I cut myself off and I flee. He uses all these verbs. They remove themselves, they isolate themselves, they flee, they take refuge. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace whatever they lost. It's his promise. Allah will replace it, not even with the equal, but with, say it. Better. Allah will give you better than what you left off for him. This is the promise of Allah. His Messenger وسلم, taught us this. When we make istikhara dua, which is probably like the most made dua, I think dua.com actually says like top duas, it's like istikhara, right? And you can see, especially during wedding season, the big one. <laughs> what are you saying to Allah? Oh Allah, if this is good for me, give it to me. If it's not good for me, turn it away from me and turn me away from it. And replace it with something better for me. Mm -hmm. Such that I don't miss it. Right? So Ibn Ajiba, he says here in his tafsir, he says that the sunnah of Allah is that anytime somebody does something for Allah that cuts them, removes them, isolates them, Allah Ta'ala will replace whatever they left off with something better for them. And look at what happened. They left as a few young men, three young guys, right? A small group of people maybe that were trying to preserve their religion. Allah Ta'ala, through unconventional means, preserved and protected them. And when they woke up, they woke up not only with a few people who joined their religion and believed like them, but an entire community that supported them. Mm -hmm. If you give up something for Allah, if you give up something from the creation, then the creator becomes the one who replaces whatever you gave up. And anyone who has Allah needs nothing. They have everything. Anyone who doesn't have Allah is always in need. And they have nothing. This dunya will try to get you convinced that you can replace Allah with some things. This will make me happy. This will make me feel fulfilled. This will give me satisfaction. This and this and this. But there were people who were stuck in a cave for three centuries who have more than people who abandoned Allah and lived in castles and mansions for short lives. And the Quran tells the stories of both. Why? For a reason. That we learn that if a person has Allah, they have every single thing. And then he mentions that when they fled and they got to the cave, Allah Ta'ala gave them mercy. And even though the cave was dingy, he made it beautiful for them through his guidance and he took the veils away from everything that could be distracting to them and let them focus on Allah alone. And this is why they became a legend that is memorialized now in this book and that people like us can learn from. I want to share one last thing as well. Sorry, Sheikh, I'm taking too much time. 309 years. Long time. They themselves lived. We know those 309 years, but none of us are going to live that long. Allah knows best, of course, but as far as we know, we're not going to live that long. Right? Yes? Now we got a few like Elon Musk fans here that are like, well, I, I just bought a cyber truck. We'll see. <laughs> right? Let me tell you something. You might not be the person who's living 309 years with the community of Muslims. But if you live your life right now, that'll be your progeny. At times you feel alone. Look at the people who came and built the Muslim community in America for us. Sheikh, I mean, Sheikh always tells stories. This isn't a joke. This is a real thing. Sheikh always tells stories. Growing up in Arlington, Jumu'ah prayer, not guaranteed at all. Jumu'ah prayer is like, we're waiting on Friday morning. Why am I looking at this phone? We're waiting on Friday morning for one of these phones 
Yes, salam alaikum. Yeah, alaikum salam. Yes, Sister Shagufta, is that you? Yes, it's me. <laughs> Have you done Hajj yet? No, not yet. <laughs> like that, like that callback. Okay. Are we having Jumaat today? Yes, we're having Jumaat today. Where? Uh, there's a small room available in the Arlington Rec Center. It can fit about twelve of us, inshallah. That's Jumaat. For not one year, not two years, a decade plus. This is Dallas, Texas. Now, Jumu'ah in Dallas, Texas, you sit back and you're like, Omar Suleiman? <laughs> Sheikh Abdel Nasser? Sheikh Omar? Mufti Kamani? Sheikh Yasser Qadi? Who do I want to, Sheikh Mikhail Smith? Who do I want to listen to? I, I, maybe I'll do two. I don't know. I'm feeling particularly religious today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Can you believe it? And you tell some of the, and you see it. Dr. Amr Shaquille, may Allah have mercy on him and make this all in his scale. Those people who were there in the beginning, who had to work hard to bend, to, to apply for the recreation center room and put a little bit of money down to make sure that they could reserve it, those people now, wallahi, you see them in the front row of these masajid, they're speechless. Yeah. And you walk up to them and you're like, what's going on? They're like, I can't believe, I, I can't believe this. Because they saw what it was. They were the people who took refuge. They were the ones who took refuge. And because of their refuge, because they ran to the cave, they came here to work and learn, but they remembered Allah before they went to work and before they went to college. Abdul Hamid Doger in Chicago used to say, when I got my paycheck, I would cut off the top immediately what I needed for the masjid, and then I would give my wife the rest and say, we got to figure it out. The masjid was not secondary. The masjid was first. And then we'd figure out our groceries and whatever else. Until today, because of that sacrifice. He's passed away. May Allah have mercy on him. Islamic Foundation, my masjid in Villa Park that I grew up in. Five decades. Fifty years. Till today, expanding. Till today, buying more land. Till today, growing. On the day of judgment, he might not even recognize what it is. Because what he remembers was a small library that he bought from a private school where he built Jama'ah prayer. If you commit to Allah, what you can accomplish is greater than your wildest imaginations. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us this tawfiq. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us people that seek refuge with him. And we seek refuge from everything else. We ask Allah to make him enough for us. And that we don't seek anything beyond him. We don't seek anything more than him. But we realize that everything is from him. We ask Allah to give us only goodness and to protect us from anything evil that we want. And to replace the evil that afflicts us with that which is better for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us those that see his effect in everything. And that we always thank him for the good and seek his protection from those tests that are bad. We ask Allah ta'ala to allow us to follow his blessed messenger, his chosen messenger, his beloved, his Mustafa, Al-Habib Mustafa, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until the end of time. And we ask that Allah allow him to take us into Jannah by his hands. And that we're able to be his companion in the highest level of paradise. We ask Allah to accept from us every act of worship that we've done. We ask Allah to give us the acts of worship that we intended to do, but we couldn't do. The ones that we hoped to do, but we failed to do. We ask Allah to count us amongst those who were able to complete our Quran, pray our 20 rakat, that we're able to give our sadaqat, that we're able to do all of these beautiful deeds. Oh Allah, count it amongst us, for us, even if we weren't able to do it, Ya Allah. And forgive us for our shortcomings and our negligence this month, Ya Allah. And allow us to see countless more Ramadans, Ya Allah, because this is the feeling and this is the experience, Ya Allah, that we need to bring us closer to you. Amin, amin, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Shaykhna. I was just going to share just two comments to add to the dua, beautiful dua that Ustad just made. This dua, it mentions two very special words, Rahma and Rashad. Rahma and Rashad. And the Prophet ﷺ used to pray for these things. Rahma is the mercy of Allah. In the rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. Allah's mercy encompasses everything. Right? The Prophet ﷺ tells us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has proclaimed in rahmati ghalabat ghadabi. Allah says, my mercy is greater than my wrath and my anger. So in this dua, we learn to ask Allah for His mercy. May Allah grant us His mercy. And no matter what we're dealing with, where we're at, what we're going through, what we're facing, Allah's mercy is greater. Always remember that. So surrender yourself to Allah's mercy. That's what they did in the cave. And the second thing they ask Allah for is rashad. Rushd. Rashad which means 
direction. Oh, like give me direction in life. And the Prophet ﷺ used to make dua for this a lot. Because nobody faced more difficulties and obstructions than the Prophet ﷺ did. No one faced more obstacles than the Prophet ﷺ. In one dua, he said, وَمَا قَضَيْتَ لَنَا مِنْ قَضَائِنْ Oh Allah, whatever you have decided for us, فَجَعَلَ عَاقِبَتَهُ رَشَدًا Oh Allah, make it always work out at the end of the day. In another dua, the Prophet ﷺ used to make dua, اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها. Oh Allah, all of our affairs, at the end of the day, make them all work out and make everything fall into place. وأجنا من خزي الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة and protect us from the humiliation of this world and the punishment of the hereafter. So we ask Allah for mercy and we ask Allah for direction. Amin. جزاكم الله خير. Just as I mentioned earlier today during the announcements, a couple things. Uh, we're not collecting zakat al-fitr here, but we recommend, where we do it is with, with Ma'roof, Ma'roof Dallas. So if you go to Ma'roof on their website, you can donate your zakat al-fitr. You have to do that, inshallah, before the Eid, inshallah. Make sure that you do that for yourself, and if you're responsible for people in your house, do it as soon as you can, inshallah, uh, for the individuals in your home as well, inshallah. Um, it's, tw it's about $12 per person, inshallah, just roughly. Uh, secondly, um, we are having the Qalam uh, Qiyam this Friday night, inshallah. So not tomorrow, but the night after. Uh, we're having our program. You'll see the announcement in, this, in the program tomorrow morning uh, on our Instagram, Qalam Institute. And then lastly, we have our Eclipse Prayer scheduled for Monday, just before Dhuhr Salah, inshallah. Here is at 2 p.m. Shaykh al Nasr will be here with us to share some light, uh, shed some light on the Eclipse Prayer from the Sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we'll see you Monday, inshallah, midday. Jazakallah khairan.